It's great to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Be in the house of the Lord with other believers and uh, being able to celebrate uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is, is always a joy. It is always a joy. And as usual, we'll be in the scriptures this morning. Uh, we'll be in 2 Thessalonians. If you uh, don't have a Bible with you today, you need one. Uh, these fine gentlemen would be happy to put one in your hands, so just slip it up when uh, they come by. Just want to... Um, uh, mentioned we have uh, obviously a little open water here behind me, and so we're looking forward to a, a baptism uh, of, of three folks at the end of our service here this morning, so that's exciting as well, so it's a joy. Um, one of these baptisms, I'll probably step off and, and fall into that tank, so uh, anytime you see that there's going to be a baptism, you want to make sure that you're here for that Sunday because you don't want to miss <laughs> that one great event of falling in the water. That's why this morning when I'm speaking, you'll find me up here near this wood where it's safe. Oh my, we are in 2 Thessalonians. One of my favorite passages of scripture here, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In fact, it's such a favorite of mine that uh, instead of doing it in, in one fell swoop here uh, in chapter 2, uh, going down through verse 12, I had to divide it in half. I just, I just had to do that so that next week when we get them together, we'll be able to, to get more good stuff here uh, dealing with the, the teaching of the Apostle Paul with regard to some of the end time events that are so, so very important. The Apostle Paul is trying to really encourage a church that has been phenomenal. And I believe that any time there's a church that's making progress for the Lord, you'll see Satan come along and try to hinder that progress. And that's what's happening, I believe, here in the past with the church of Thessalonica. Thessalonica is such a phenomenal church. The Apostle Paul is boasting about it to the other churches. He's telling them all about Thessalonians and how they have this great love for each other and how they have this faith that's just been growing and, and uh, more and more their trust is in the Lord. It's just really phenomenal to see what God is doing there. But along the way, there came some disturbing news. And it's gotten the people here quite discouraged. The people are discouraged because they're thinking that the day of the Lord was already come and that somehow they had missed the beginning of the day of the Lord. In fact, they were probably disturbed because they knew that after the coming of Christ to gather them up, there would be seven years of tribulation. And they certainly did not want to go through the tribulation. The Apostle Paul is going to address this concern and he's going to try to to make it very clear that indeed that that has not happened, that they should be encouraged. He has given to them 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and he seeks to bring them some more encouragement. And the apostle is going to do this by encouraging them on the basis of truth. Notice with me here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 in verse 1, where Paul writes, he says, Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our gathering together to him. The gathering together that is being spoken of here is so important. Again, the people have become discouraged. Much of their discouragement, I believe, comes from the fact that they were living in a very difficult environment. Their Christianity was costing them something. They were finding that the persecution that was bearing down on them was, was unbearable, no doubt, at times. They were still continuing to stand, but it was very problematic. All of a sudden, their lives had been changed. And when you're looking through life through your own little lens, it's possible to be able to look at some of the difficulties that you're experiencing and think to yourself, oh, I guess I've been left behind. Or perhaps I missed something important. And what the apostle is saying here is that, no, you haven't missed out. There is a gathering that is going to take place. And he mentions that there in verse 1. Now, it's important to make some distinguishing uh, points here at this juncture. Notice with me, if you flip back a page, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, this is the passage that we talked about with regard to Christ coming for his church. The church is the body of Christ, which consists of people dead and alive 
who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ from the time, if you would go all the way back to Acts chapter 2 in Pentecost, that's when the church starts, and that church age continues through today and will end when the trumpet sounds at the rapture of the church. And Christ comes back for his church, and the church is gathered to him. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, let me just read a couple of these verses. Here in verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. What an encouragement it is to stop and think about what this means for all of us. As we get into this passage, the Apostle Paul wants them to be encouraged. And he wants us to be encouraged here today as well. Let's look to the Lord in prayer, shall we? God, we just want to give you thanks for who you are and what you've accomplished for us. Father, we think of the believers in times past who thought that perhaps they'd missed out on your return. But Father, we thank you for the word of God that points out the uh, evidences of the return. We pray, Lord, that today our hearts would be truly uh, filled with the joy of the Lord as we move forward seeking to serve you, Lord, until that great day comes. We thank you, Father, for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are there in India. I thank you for this church planter there. And Father, I pray that you'd bless him as he takes forth the gospel in a very perilous scenario. May you bless the word of God and may it bear much fruit. I thank you for Bill, who's been a faithful servant of yours for many, many years. And I pray your blessing on him, Lord. I pray, Father, that you continue to see him bear fruit until the time when you call him home. God, we give you thanks for the strength that you provide for us. May you be a comfort and a strength to the Patton family at this time, Lord, I pray, during their time of loss. And may you be with us, Lord, now as we go through this passage. Be an encouragement to us, I pray, in Christ's name, amen. It's easy to become confused when we think about this great event that's described here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We would understand this great event to be the rapture, but there's also an event at the end of the tribulation time which we would reference as the second coming of Christ. It's important for us to keep the distinguishing marks apart so that we understand what the difference is so that when we come to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we understand what the apostle Paul is talking about. It is so vital for us to understand that if Jesus Christ comes back for us this afternoon, for instance, would be great with me, uh, if Jesus Christ comes back for us today, we will be in heaven at the time when Jesus Christ comes for that official second coming. Remember, during the rapture of the church, we are gathered to him. He never comes and sets his feet on the ground. We meet him in the air. That's quite a bit different than the second coming. I think of Revelation chapter 19. If you take your Bibles, you can go back to Revelation chapter 19. And you'll see what I mean here when he talks about this second coming. In chapter 19 and verse 7, it says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Who is the bride and what is the marriage supper of the Lamb? The bride, as we understand it, if you go back to, for instance, Ephesians, we know that the bride is the body of Christ. In fact, Ephesians says that the bride is made blameless and presented to the groom who is Jesus Christ. We know and understand that one of the things that's going to happen during the seven years tribulation here on the earth, this is going to happen up in heaven, is the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's a great time of celebration. It was typifying here a marriage between a man and a woman where there would be a huge marriage supper, a grand festival of sorts. And this was something of a huge priority. This is what's going to take place in heaven as we celebrate with Jesus Christ. Won't that be fantastic? It will be absolutely out of our minds fantastic. I'm looking forward to that great day. I am excited about what God is doing. But notice with me here, it describes the participants. It says it was given to her, the bride, the church. It was given to you and I to clothe herself in what? 
fine linen. Fine linen, the Bible describes as bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Prior to me coming to faith in Christ, I was unable to bear fruit on my own. I couldn't do anything that was considered righteous. But now because I'm in faith in Christ, I'm a new creature, and I have the ability, and you have the ability now to honor the Lord Jesus Christ by doing those things which are right, those righteous acts. So here we are as the church. We're there in heaven. What an exciting time. Scroll down with me a little bit here to verse 11 where it says, and I saw heaven opened. John is giving this revelation. He's writing it down. He says, I saw heaven opened and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called faithful and true. Do you want to take a guess who's sitting on the white horse? Faithful and true? None other than Jesus Christ. Obviously, it's Jesus. And it says in his righteousness, he judges and wages war. When Christ comes back for the church, he's gathering us to himself. When he comes back, however, at the end of the tribulation time, he's coming back to judge. It's totally different. His eyes are described as a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself, which I think, interject, is cool. (laughs) Nobody knows what that name is except he does. Isn't that good? I like that. I think that's just in keeping with our Lord. Amen? Amen. So here, what it says is, he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's speaking there of Jesus Christ. And the armies which are in heaven come with him. These armies, this heavenly host in heaven, who are they? Uh, Who are these people? Are they angels? Well, let's look for a clue here. It says these armies which are in heaven are clothed in what? Fine linen. Where did we just read about fine linen? Well, back up there in verse 8, it was given to her to clothe herself in, speaking of the church, fine linen. So Jesus Christ is indeed going to come back, and he's going to come back with his church. I love this next part. We are clothed in fine linen, we are white, and we are clean. Wow. To be cleansed from our unrighteousness. We are blameless in his presence At this point in time, our sin nature has been dismissed. When our body was either raptured or uh, resurrected, it is gone forever. We are now holy and blameless. We are in his presence. And he says, get on a white horse. We're going for a road trip. And Jesus Christ comes back to earth and his church comes with him. Is that exciting? Are you ready for that? I mean, this is, this is like, this is mind-boggling. This is better than anything you've done in your life. I mean, this is like amazing. But this is different than what we see over there in 2 Thessalonians. Flipping back over to 2 Thessalonians, again, looking here at verse 1, where the apostle says, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. This gathering together to him distinct from the second coming is a reference to the rapture. And this is why this context here is so important. The title of the message this morning is As You See the Day Approaching. And I find it fascinating that over in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, actually verse 25, it says this. It says, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another And this is the part I want you to to see that's so important this morning. And all the more, he says, be doing these very positive things, encouraging one another. He says, as you see the day drawing near. Now, the fact is that if he said you will be able to see the day drawing near, he pretty much expects that we'll be able to see the day drawing near. That is, you and I, as believers, as followers of Christ, will have an awareness that things are going in such a way that you can see the return of the Lord Jesus Christ coming closer and closer. In other words, it may not be noticed by the world. 
It may not even be noticed by some Christians who perhaps maybe are not studying the word of God or, or, or spending time trying to, to, to see what God is doing. But to those who look, he says, you will be able to notice that the day of the Lord is coming. You're going to see it. There are certain things that are happening in the world today that would point to the reality of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe, in the not-too-distant future. I couldn't predict when. I wouldn't try to predict when. But one of the things that we know is that we can see it. So as Paul says these things to the Thessalonians, he's very much concerned about where they are at in their mindset concerning the day of the Lord. Notice with me as we go back here to verse 2. As you'll see here in verse 2, he says that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. He's very concerned. He mentions that word quickly there. I don't want you to be quickly shaken. The idea here of being quickly shaken, the the quickly part is not talking about a short period of time. It's actually speaking here about uh, a quality of their actions. In other words, they were acting more hastily and rashly. And he's concerned about that. They had been taught differently, and he's concerned that they were jumping away from the truth that they had been taught. But he says then, second of all, he says quickly shaken, and he gives the idea of being being pushed around. This was a term that was used of uh, an ocean wave that would rock a boat. Uh, If you've ever been on a boat where it's it's rocking back and forth, it's it's pretty amazing. Uh, But sometimes you have to have your right leg go up and your left leg go down and then you reverse it and your left leg goes up and your right leg goes down and you're trying to to do that. I've spent more days fishing uh, on the ocean in very bad conditions that that was very normal. I remember a time we were coming back on one of the big ferry boats from Nantucket and it was pitching back and forth and people were having a very, very difficult time standing up. So most people went below and were sick (laughs) because it was pitching back and forth. It was was shaking. And and I remember um, standing there not being sick and just in delight because I wasn't sick. (laughs) Pitching back and forth like that gives you the the feeling that, wow, they're being shaken from their their mental moorings. They they knew what was true. They knew what Paul had just said. Remember over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that last verse in chapter 4, he says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. They're supposed to be comforted. Knowing that the return of the Lord Jesus Christ could happen at any moment, that Jesus Christ was coming, the wrath of God was not upon them, This was to be encouraged. That quickly shaken, he uses that passive voice, which means to be shaken from outside forces, these wrong teachings. And to the point where they were disturbed, the Bible says, it gives the idea of of being in such inner turmoil that you're frightened and you're crying aloud. You see, some were coming to them and trying to teach them from the standpoint of the spiritual. There were those who were, quote unquote, prophets who were supposed to be giving some new information from God. Remember, that was common in the early church leading up to the completion of our Bible. And these prophets would come, and that's why the Bible says to try the spirits, test the spirits, make sure that they're from God. In this situation, they weren't. And they were speaking about a day of the Lord, and they were trying to discourage these believers. Man, I'll tell you, it's nothing, it's nothing worse than losing heart. Isn't that true? Here they are, they're going through all this persecution and they just got... It, it was these false prophets. It was these false messages. It was these false letters. He says there's a letter that's going around. I believe Paul believed that there was indeed a, a letter that was going around that was a forgery of the Apostle Paul. Satan will stop at nothing. Notice the last verse of 2 Thessalonians. You'll see there in verse 17. Paul says this. He says, I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hands. And this is a distinguishing mark in every letter. And this is the way I write. And this is what he says. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. He says, you'll be able to know whether or not I wrote it because I always attach this greeting to it. You see, the other one that was a forgery evidently did not. 
All this was meant to discourage these people, to try to keep them from really rallying and serving Christ to the level that they were being boasted about by the Apostle Paul. So Paul gets right down to it. And you'll notice there in verse 3, he says, let no one in any way deceive you. For it, then the it is a reference going back to the day of the Lord, for it will not come unless, and he says basically there's two signs that are going to occur that indicate that the day of the Lord has begun. One is the falling away, and the other is the revealing of the lawlessness, the man of lawlessness or the man of sin, he is going to be revealed. So these two marks were what they were supposed to see prior to the day of the Lord beginning. And Paul begins here by talking about this this falling away. And you might have a different translation in your Bible. I have apostasy in the New American Standard. It's not going to come, he says, unless the apostasy comes first. Uh, This falling away has been usually taught in churches in over years. I grew up with uh, these teachings. In fact, uh, Hebrew has a, a pretty good quote. The falling away indicates a tragic movement within the sphere of professed Christendom. Uh, the treason of the avowed friends of Christ, while the public manifestation of the man of sin in the arena of history marks the personal culmination of the hostility of the avowed enemies of Christ. Well, this falling away has been talked about for years. Uh, The end isn't going to come until there's first a falling away. It's interesting to note here uh, that this word that's being used, uh, apostia, is actually a transliteration. And they transliterate it out and we get apostasy from it. It's a combined word. Here in the text that we're looking at, it is actually a noun, and it's preceded by a definite article. The uses of it are minimal. There's one other place in the New Testament where it's used. The Septuagint, that, that, that's a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Uh, it's used over in Joshua chapter 22, but it's, it's not very useful in trying to understand how it actually is meant to be. So as I was a young person, I always would hear that before Christ uh, comes, before the rapture takes place, there needs to be a falling away. And so I've been in lots of church services where the pastors preached about the falling away. Uh, And we all look back and we see that there's just been a falling away, hasn't there? All those who are about my age, amen, we've, <laughs> yeah, see, we, we can identify with the falling away. I mean, how many of you went to um, Wednesday night church when you were first saved? You, you know, sometimes you went to Wednesday night church. How many were a part of churches that had Sunday night services? Okay, most of you went to Sunday night. And see, people would say, see that, the church is just dying off because we don't have Wednesday night, we don't have Sunday night, and, uh, you know, we don't go door-to-door calling anymore. Well, it's interesting But I don't think any of these points have a bearing on what's being spoken of here. Uh, Because if I think about this falling away, and there's an article in front of that that Greek word, which makes it, and and Paul didn't have to put the article in there, but he does. It's an event. It, It is a major event, the falling away, not a process of time falling away. We could look at Revelation and say, well, the church is becoming more Laodicean. Well, we've always had lukewarm Christians, haven't we? Sure, there has been. Uh, But what this event is being spoken of is something that's very unique. It's the falling away. When I think of the church and I think of the core belief of the church, I think of the gospel. I think of the gospel of grace that is so central to everything that we have, do, and teach here. So I would understand this, that this core has got to be compromised in some way so that the gospel is not being conveyed as a gospel of grace anymore. Now, He's describing it as a major event. This is all of a sudden going to happen. It's going to happen and boom, you don't have churches anymore preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
problem with that is I believe that the reason the Lord tarries is because we do have the gospel of Jesus Christ being taught. I know that a lot of my uh, uh, people that I know, pastors that are standing in the pulpit, are totally committed to a gospel of grace. And I don't think that I would preach something different, not because of me, but because of the Holy Spirit of God that dwells in me. And so there are certain things that as I think about this, I have some questions about. And so I found that it's interesting to note that over history, there has been a different translation than falling away or rebellion, which comes from Joshua's Septuagint translation. And there is, um, for instance, a Greek lexicon that defines apostasia first as a defection and then secondly as a departure, a departure rather than a falling away. When I went to some of the background here and I, I ran across someone who had pointed this out and I started to do a little digging around, found that this is what's true. If you go back to Bible versions of the past, and you go back a long way, like before you and me were alive, you know, and born, we're going back to the Wycliffe Bible. How many have heard of the Wycliffe Bible? Okay, many of you have heard of the Wycliffe Bible. That's an old one, right? How many have that Bible on your shelves? Not too many. It's worth a lot of money, I'm sure. 1384, Wycliffe Bible, when the translators of the Wycliffe Bible came to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, they translate that word that's been transliterated apostasy, they translated it departure. And again, it's an event. There is that definite article that Paul put in there. He didn't have to put it in, but he does. So he wants to point out that there's something very significant here. And he says that this event, and he calls it the departure talks about this. This is translated with the Tyndall Bible. You've heard of that. And there, now we've moved up to 1526, Coverdale Bible, the Cranmer Bible, uh, 1500s, Breach's Bible, and the Geneva Bible of 1608 all translated this word departure. It's not until you come to the next big translation that you find that there's a divergence and it's no longer translated departure, but instead falling away. What's the next big translation? The King James Bible, 1611. And they are the first ones that use the term the falling away. So I found that that is uh, pretty interesting. Notice with me, if you go back here to our text in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not, for the day of the Lord will not come unless, let's read it this way, the departure comes first. If you read that, the departure comes first, you would tend to believe, no doubt, that the departure is a reference to what? The rapture. In fact, next week when we get into some of the verses following, but I'd be in trouble if I went to verse 7, see? But if we look at it, we can actually compare a couple of things here literary-wise that the Apostle Paul uses that gives us more credibility as we look ahead towards this. And so even the people in the past, I think of Jerome with the Latin Vulgate in 400 uh, AD, he is going to render this same Greek word departure as well. And most English translations, though, have followed the King James. I think it has been incorrectly done. I think it should be understood more carefully as the departure. I could be wrong, but my thinking is that it's a reference here, a definite and clear reference to the rapture. So he is talking here, and I ran across a quote that I think it sums it up because there's good reason for the Apostle Paul to speak this way. Uh, one gentleman writes, he says, remember the Thessalonians had been led astray by the false teaching that the day of the Lord had already come. This was confusing because Paul offered great hope in the first letter of a departure to be with Christ and a rescue from God's wrath. Now a letter purporting to be from Paul seems to say that they would first have to go through the day of the Lord. And Paul then clarified his prior teaching by emphasizing they had no need to worry. They could again be comforted because the departure he had discussed in his first letter and in his teaching while with them was still the truth. 
The departure of Christians to be with Christ and the subsequent revelation of the lawless one, Paul argues, is proof the day of the Lord has not begun as they had thought. Paul seeks to bring them comfort by writing on this. Well, it's interesting. That's the first thing that he talks about, but the second is also of great significance. He mentions here that the man of lawlessness is to be revealed. He's speaking here, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. The man of perdition, the man of destruction, this man of sin, this, this son of perdition, as it's sometimes translated, is a reference to none other than the false Messiah, the Antichrist. The Antichrist will be revealed at this point and time, and it's important for the people of Israel uh, down the road to know and understand some of these significances. For the church here, he is described as an entirely dominated individual, dominated by sin, the man of sin. He is the embodiment of wickedness, and when he mentions the son of perdition, He's speaking here about a person who has this characteristic of being evil and it implies the opposite of salvation and it leads to his absolute destruction. Notice what he says here in verse four. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship. Isn't that what Satan has been about since the beginning? Satan said, I'm going to exalt myself above the heavens. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. And the one thing that Satan wants to do is he wants to be worshipped as God is worshipped. That's the thing he wants. More than anything else, Satan wants to have what is not his. That which belongs to God alone, which is our worship and our adoration. It's uniquely belonging to God. In our Daniel study here this summer, we'll be talking about the Antichrist quite a bit. We'll be understanding that he makes a peace treaty. According to Daniel uh, chapter 9, he makes a peace treaty with Israel. He's going to break that peace treaty at the middle point of the tribulation. It's fascinating. But you'll see here in our text this morning that he takes his seat, the Bible says, in the temple of God. Now, the people of Israel are very intent on building, rebuilding the temple. The temple was destroyed in 70 AD, but they are intent on building the third temple. In fact, there's a growing temple movement even today. Now remember what Hebrews 10, 25 said. Draw together more so to encourage each other as you see the day drawing near. My friends, we see a lot of alignment in this world today. We really do. And part of it is right there in Israel. Things that are taking place right now. This temple movement is, is truly uh, amazing. A lot of Israelites uh, today, they believe that they should erect the temple, that it should be built on the temple mount. Do you know that there's a day every single year in the Hebrew, uh, uh, Hebrew month that uh, the Jews fast and they cry and they mourn over the destruction of the temple that's 2,000 years ago? How is it possible that they are mourning for that? How is it that they are so motivated to build a new temple? Uh, One person said, but we need to build a real temple. We have built many little, little temples, this uh, rabbi said. And so to that end, they have begun schools in Israel that are diligently studying all the intricate laws of the temple And the Jews of all backgrounds are coming to visit the Temple Mount every single month. To further the advocacy, the Temple Institute recently released a short video. It's called The Children Are Ready. I found that interesting. The Children Are Ready. It dramatically portrays young Jewish kids dragging their fathers out of the synagogues in order to join in the rebuilding program of the Third Temple. Wow, they're ready. 
Well, this temple is going to be rebuilt. I believe it will be rebuilt in the very initial stages of that seven years of tribulation. I believe that this false Messiah, the Messiah that they're looking for, that they'll believe is the true Messiah, they'll throw their backing behind. He'll make it possible while God is pouring out his judgment upon the earth, he'll make it possible for Israel to dwell in some peace during the midpoint or during the uh, beginning of the tribulation up until the midpoint temple will get rebuilt. But the Antichrist is not interested in restoring Jewish worship. What he wants when he builds that temple is a place in the Holy of Holies to be worshiped himself. That's this Antichrist. My friends, I don't know. The Antichrist could be alive today. He could be alive today, but he hasn't been revealed yet. Uh, You see, upon the rapture of the church and the church is taken out of the way immediately following there will be this man of sin revealed the world won't see him as a man of sin there won't be any right just left on the earth after the rapture takes place he will be their savior but he is a false messiah but he will be revealed and the world will run after him My friends, the reason why Jesus Christ has not come back yesterday or the day before that is because he waits upon perhaps someone like you. He is waiting as people need to still place their faith in Jesus Christ. And maybe you're here this morning and maybe you're not sure about where you're going to spend your eternity. If you're here as a Christian, you should be encouraged. The day of the Lord has not begun yet. The trumpet has not sounded When the rapture occurs, you'll be among the first to know. God is doing a mighty work. Satan opposes him at every point. But never so more personal is his opposition in our own personal lives. Where Satan tries to keep people from placing their faith in Jesus. Maybe you're here this morning and you've not taken that step of faith. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You say, well, why do I I need to be saved? You need to be saved the same reason I needed to be saved. The whole reason everyone needs to be saved, and that is because there's none righteous, no, not one. And the penalty for our sin is death. And the Bible tells us that Jesus gives everlasting life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except to be through me. This morning, have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? If there's questions in your mind, I pray that before you leave here today, you'll find the answers. That you'll walk from here certain in your own heart that you are a person of faith. Let's pray. Father, we pray this morning thanking you. Thanking you for the encouragement that the truth brings. In times past to the church at Thessalonians, had there and we just thank you father for their testimony and their walk with you father you give us encouragement today as well we are blessed lord to know that you have made great plans for your church lord one day you will come and gather her to you we don't know the day or the hour we pray that we would be ready father if i I pray for anyone here today who's uncertain of their spiritual condition, Lord. May they today seek answers. May they come to place their faith in Jesus Christ. Father, may your church be found faithful. May we truly seek to honor you in all things. As the day grows nearer, Lord, may we be aware. and May we continue to work we might truly exalt your name. We thank you, Father, for all this in Jesus' name. Amen.